what they do believe is that somehow it's the duty of Christians to support the gathering of the Jews and to support the state of Israel. And they take one verse in scripture in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God says to Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and those that curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the world will be blessed. This is possibly one of the most used scriptures of the century. Christians, uh, Christian evangelicals will quote you this verse to justify their undying support for Israel. Why? Because this scripture has been used to imply that the blessing to Abraham was not just to Abraham, but to all of Israel. And therefore, for all Jews, for all time. Believe it or not, they go even further to call it the only unconditional promise verse in the Bible because they read about Israel in the Bible and they equate the Israel of the Bible with the modern day Israel state of Israel. They sort of jump over thousands of years of history and they jump over most of the old and the new testament any book that instructs you to commit genocide so that somehow a messiah comes down and sits on the temple as a political king any book that gives you the impression that you are better than the rest of humanity any book that is forged and interpolated to give you yourself authority to occupy the lands of other bomb civilians burn the children and women alive rape the prisoners displace and ethnically cleanse the original inhabitants and above all turn around and try to convince the whole world that the live genocide we just watch did not actually happen and you are the victim in this case the evangelicals however believe that jesus will only come back when all of the jews are gathered in the holy land and therefore because they are eager to see their lord and their savior they are willing to do everything they can, including supporting Israel with money and weapons to kill civilians in Palestine. We stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body, for apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made. None. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. The second part is people should understand by now that should be crystal clear that Israel, Israel is the single greatest strength America has in the Middle East. I always say to my friends when they say those things to you, I say imagine our circumstance in the world were there no Israel. How many battleships would there be? How many troops would be stationed? You know, I used to say, early on when I was a kid, I'd say, when I was a young senator, I'd say, if I were a Jew, I'd be a Zionist. I am a Zionist. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. Did the U.S. invent Israel in the Middle East? Does Israel have the right to exist? Do Palestinians have the right to exist? Whose land is it? Does it belong to Israelis or Palestinians? What does the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran say about the Holy Land of the Prophets? Did God promise the Israelites the land that stretches from the river to the sea? What does the Bible say about the ethnic cleansing and genocides? Is it morally acceptable for the God of the Bible to annihilate an entire people for the sake of another people who caused corruption and killed prophets their entire existence? And if so, why does Israel matter to Christian evangelicals? Are there any theological and political obligations for the Christian evangelicals to support Israel? This video is going to be a bit spicy. I suspect some people will be fired up. If you are, let me know in your thoughts in the comment section. Make sure you watch the whole video as I talk about the theological obligations for the Christians supporting Israel.
because the truth will always prevail. And the light of knowledge will always wipe out the darkness of ignorance. And this, my friends, requires some uncomfortable conversations. Before you make any comments, listen to what former President Jimmy Carter says about EPAC and the Jews. If you ever wonder why Jimmy Carter only served one term president, it's because of his stance on Palestine. Want to know, and um, many Israelis don't want to know what um, is going on inside Palestine. It, it's a, it's a terrible human rights persecution that is far transcends what any outsider would imagine. And there are powerful political forces in America that prevents any objective analysis of the problem in the Holy Land. Uh, I think it's accurate to say that, that not, not a single member of Congress with, which I'm, with whom I'm familiar would possibly speak out and um, call for Israel to withdraw to their legal boundaries or to um, publicize the plight of the Palestinians. And that is um, headed on to by the uh, very effective work of the American-Israeli uh, group called APAC, which is uh, performing its completely legitimate task of convincing Americans to support the policies of the Israeli government. And uh, APAC is not dedicated to peace. They're, they're dedicated to uh, inducing the maximum support in America, in the White House, in the Congress, and in the public media. Israel has been declared by the International Court of Justice, the United Nations, and other inter entities as an apartheid state for committing a genocide in Palestine. The sheer level of evil we have seen is beyond imagination. The Holocaust is nothing compared to what's happening in Palestine right now. Israel continues to ignore the entire world. This is happening on our watch, live, and no words can describe the inhumane act of Israel. I have watched some of the most horrific footages of kids, women, and civilians. Mind you not, I come from an emergency room trauma background, and I have never seen something like this. Unfortunately, I can't share it with you due to how graphic they are. Yet Israel continues. It's evil and the Christian Zionists, the Christian evangelicals, are cheering the genocide. This genocide did not start on October the 7th or October the 6th, nor did it start on October the 5th or the year before that. This genocide has been going on for 76 years. The U.S. has dismissed the decision of the International Court of Justice, deeming Israel as an apartheid state and Netanyahu as a war criminal. The U.S. acted on behalf of the Christian Zionists, the Christian evangelicals. Hypocrisy remains the trademark of the U.S. politics. See, when it comes to Ukraine, the U.S. fully supports the militia the freedom fighters with whatever is needed in order to fight back and defend themselves against the Russian invasion. However, when it comes to Palestinians, they are not supposed to defend themselves. And it seems as if the Palestinians are expected to just pack and leave their ancestries' lands and give it to someone else who claims that God promised them the land some 3,000 years. I mean, ask yourself, do they have the right to defend themselves against the Israeli invasions and genocide? If you answer yes to Ukraine, but no to Palestine, you are not only a hypocrite, but also someone who is prejudiced, ignorant, inhuman, and most of all, extreme. Let me give you an analogy, and I want you to be honest with yourself. Your great, great, great grandfather came to the States, to the U.S. on the boat. He built a house and then later on, he bought, a, uh, he bought himself a wife. 
your great 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 grandfather was the first to build and live in that house before anyone else when he passed away the deed or the title of that house has been transferred down through generations and now you are the person that owns that house imagine someone else comes to you and says this house that you own right now is mine because my holy book says so if you resist i'm going to kill you and your entire family so you refuse to leave the house and rightly so since you own the house and your ancestors owned it right so tell me please for the sake of argument what would you do are you going to convince yourself that indeed your house is his because his holy book says so or you're going to fight till your last breath since he has endless support from other people who want to turn your own property into a real estate uh, profit i hope you got the message similarly the unwavering financial and political support by the christian zionists comes to no surprise with religious discourse to expedite the second coming of the messiah whom the jews don't even recognize confused yet wait you're not the only one for this reason i decided to make this video that will have two parts to it the religious component which i will try to discuss today and the geopolitical side that i will represent i will present next week about the one reason they don't want you to know why evangelicals are blindly supporting israel and hopefully i can top that with a cherry making another video to explain why palestine does not belong to the zionist jews starting from the flood of noah all the way to the current time so most christians today are unaware that the zionists jews don't even believe in the christian god at all and most of them are atheists and the few jews that believe in the coming of their messiah are convinced that their messiah their king is not the same messiah the christians and the muslims anticipate if anything the muslims and in this case the palestinians revere jesus to the utmost respect and like the jews we supposedly killed the christian god so if that's the case why does the west fervently supports israel while the american people the taxpayers can't even afford the very basic forms of living yet the majority of this american tax money ends up in the israeli lobby suitcase throughout this genocide that's happening in gaza and for decades before that american evangelicals have been some of the most powerful voices for israel and that's saying a lot more than 40 percent of americans describe themselves as evangelicals conservative christians remain the backbone of the republican party's support for israel and they drive the national debates on some hot debated issues such as abortion immigration education and even race they believe that god made a promise to the jewish people designating palestine as their homeland and they see uh, the creation of israel in 1948 as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy this idea known as christian zionism can be traced back for centuries so with all the weight that conservative christians have in the u.s how much of these ideas are driving american policies on the middle east and why is the genocide and the ethnic cleansing waged by israel in palestine sparking a debate among christian churches in the u.s we have seen a rise of christian churches that are now starting to speak up against the apartheid state of israel and the genocide in palestine understand that christian zionism 
is an old phenomenon. And there are different kinds of Christian Zionists. But the broad thread that connects them all together is a political position on Zionism in Israel based on, on some interpretations of scriptures. We support Israel because we believe the Bible. The Bible is a Zionist text. The Bible presents the Jewish people as the apple of God's eye, as the chosen people, as a cherished people, as a covenant people with an eternal, with an eternal covenant to the land that is forever. The title deed to the land of Israel is recorded in the Bible, which gives the Jewish people a clear and unclouded title to that land forever. It belongs to them and it belongs to them only. So follow me closely and pay attention. Um, some thoughts on John Hagee's theology first. He promotes a bizarre doctrine, which he refers to as the prophetic blessing. If you listen to his sermons, you will frequently hear him state how you can, quote, and quote, release God in your life, end of quote. As if God is some type of energy force we can tap into. In his book, Born to be Blessed, Hagee provides tips on how you can release the God-ordained prophetic blessing in your families through the spoken word and physical touch. Like his prosperity teachings, Hagee's prophetic blessing doctrine runs contrary to the actual tradition Christian teachings. One of the most disturbing teachings which Hagee holds to is that the Jewish people can be saved without believing in Jesus Christ. According to his account, Hagee's um, allegedly stated, and I quote, trying to convert Jews is a waste of time. Everyone else, whether Buddhists or Baha'i or whatever it might be, they need to believe in Jesus, but not Jews. Jews already have a covenant with God that has never been replaced with Christianity. End of quote. So obviously, this is rank heresy and impossible to substantiate not only um, biblically, but also in all the books. And I am only talking here about the theology we all share with some differences. But since Hagee's defenders might challenge the authenticity of this citation, here is a direct quote from his 1984 book should Christians support Israel. And I quote, he says, there are right now Jewish peoples in this earth who have a powerful and special relationship with God. Let us put an end to the Christian charter or charter that all Jews are lost and cannot be in the of God and they'll be convert to Christianity. There are a certain number of Jews in relationship with God right now through divine election. End of quote. Now, I would say John Hagee idolizes Israel to an extreme and unbiblical extent. He accuses all Christians of being heretics and anti Semites by using the standard replacement theology, uh, pejorative, to describe the Christian system. I am not sure what happened to the covenant theology, which indicates that the church consists of both Jewish and Gentile uh, believers who all have an equal standing before God because of their common faith in Jesus Christ. Now, by discouraging Christians to refrain from evangelizing and repentant Jews, Hagee is teaching a doctrine that is in direct contradiction with the teaching of the New Testament in many places. Hagee's um, hyper-Christian Zionism has led him to conclude that Jesus refused to tell the Jews that he was the Messiah, which is laughable. In his book, In Defense of Israel, Hagee stated that Jesus refused to be their Messiah, choosing instead to be the savior of the world. However, Contra Hagee, Jesus in John uh, chapter 10, verse 25, 
plainly told the Jews that he was the Messiah. And throughout his ministry, Christ constantly referred to himself as the Son of Man, a designation which at that time was a referent for a Messiah. Additionally, in the same in the same book, Hagee restricts his definition of the Messiah to a political uh, deliverer alone. And lastly, Hagee also holds to a bizarre eschatological uh, schema known as the Blood Moon Prophecy. This Blood Moon Prophecy states that a series of four consecutive lunar eclipses, which began on April 2014 and ended on September 2015, are signs of the end times described in uh, Joel, Acts, and Revelation. Language here, such as the sun um, being turned to darkness and the moon turning to blood, is the creation language. His incredibly extreme and heretical views about Israel and the Jewish people, and his incomplete view of uh, Jesus' messiahship, uh, classifies Hagee as not only a false teacher, but also a wealthy political evangelical businessman that runs a multi-million dollar church just like the other mega churches who could care less about your well-being and there are plenty of them that cry a river to exploit the vulnerable na uh, naive uh, christian people Israel is God's chosen people, always have been God's chosen people, always will be God's chosen people. Go to the phone right now and call that number and say, yes, I'm going to stand with Israel. I'm going to bless the people of the Bible. I'm going to bless God's chosen people. Will those of you in this audience who support the state of Israel stand to your feet and give a shout of support? Unfortunately, some of them are really far out and they have gone away astray. They are literally a useful tool the evangelicals use for financial convenience. Some others believe that it's the duty of Christians to support Israel because somehow that helps Jesus come back again, the second coming. It's basically tied into their interpretation of prophecies and end of times. So you may have heard about the uh, Left Behind series or the late great planet Earth. These are very popular sensationalized express expressions of Christian Zionism that says the end of the world is near. The creation of the state of Israel is a harbinger of the second coming of Christ, that somehow Christians are supposed to support this state that commits genocides as part of God's plan for the world. Now, does that make sense? Think about it. You support killing children and women in order to expedite the second coming of Jesus? I mean, what's the point of Christ coming back? To reward you and the so-called the chosen people of God for killing humanity? And what is Christ's attitude towards the very Christian evangelicals for supporting um, genocide? It's a, a mind-boggling how Christian evangelicals interpret their scriptures. However, I have to make a distinction that not all Christians believe or support Israel. What they do believe is that somehow it's the duty of Christians to support the gathering of the Jews and to support the state of Israel. And they take one verse in scripture in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God says to Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and those that curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the world will be blessed. This is possibly one of the most used scriptures of the century. Christians, uh, Christian evangelicals will quote you this verse to justify their undying support for Israel. Why? Because this scripture has been used to imply that the blessing to Abraham was not just to Abraham, 
but to all of Israel, and therefore for all Jews for all time. Believe it or not, they go even further to call it the only unconditional promise verse in the Bible. That's why the Christian evangelicals say we need this blessing. We must support the state of Israel because that's the only way to obtain God's blessing. This is, of course, all related to the covenant mentioned in the Bible. But the moral story between Ishmael and Isaac is way deeper than what most consider. The Ishmaelites were blessed, and God indeed fulfilled his covenant with them. Even the great Maimonides confirms this, and we'll get to that uh, in a minute. The Christian Zionists, however, totally dismiss God's covenant with the Ishmaelites. They believe that God gave everything to one chunked the other to the desert despite the Torah calling him blessed and let his descendant descendants wander and wallow in idolatry and then a false religion was established that still correctly calls to the worship of the God of Abraham the one and only true God of Jesus evangelicals also deny Ishmael rights as the eldest son and was given a special promise and blessings the Bible says when Ishmael was 14, Isaac was born. And that's in Genesis chapter, I believe, 21, verse 14 to 17. Muslims are the descendants of Abraham, spiritually, as well as physically in the case of Prophet Abraham. Modern Israel is not the ancient Israel and cannot be considered the children of Israel. Modern Israel is defined by historians and scientists as white European Zionists who migrated from all around Europe and mainly Eastern Europe. Their DNA does not match the original inhabitants of Levant region, while modern Palestinians' DNA 100% matches the original people of the land. Genetic studies confirm that modern day Palestinians descend from the earliest hunter gatherers and farmer populations that inhabited the Levant region over 10,000 years. Other Bronze and Iron Age civilization that emerged in the region, like the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, the Israelites, and the Philistines, also left genetic imprints in today's Palestine gene pool. Now, the study that was published in the journal Cell focused on the DNA of ancient Philistines. The results therefore confirmed that Palestinians uh, descend in part from the ancient Philistines who lived in the same region over 3,000 years ago. This study also provided new genetic insights into ancestors of modern populations in the Levant region. For instance, uh, Jews exhibit more European genetic ancestry in their paternal lineages, likely due to European male converts integrating into Jewish communities. On the other hand, Palestinians show a greater mix of Egyptian, Arabian, and sub Saharan African genes reflecting the historical movements and interactions with the Levant regions. You can check this for yourself, and I'll put the link in the comment section. And back to the scriptures, this cannot be interpreted to mean that no matter what the current state of Israel, which was recently established by the British, was never to be confronted or judged by other peoples or nations for committing genocides. God clearly stated in Deuteronomy 28 that even the nation of Israel, the old tribes of Israel, were subject to um, accountability and obedience to God's laws in order to have God's blessing. And if we take Genesis promise in context, the children of Israel disobeyed God's commands and were crushed and cursed forever. It would be a stretch of imagination and illusion to come to a conclusion that this promise 
meant the modern state of affairs concerning the modern British entity. The question that still requires investigation is, how did they get the blessing from this verse? What's the definition of the blessing? How do you claim and receive the blessing by committing genocides? The problem is, of course, is that Genesis 12 verse 3 is totally a false interpretation of scripture because God did not say that all the nations of the world are blessed through, through Netanyahu or the state of Israel or America or the evangelicals or the mega churches or Trump or Biden. God used Abraham as a singular through you, O Abraham, right? And Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian. Abraham was a monotheist who submitted to the will of the Creator and worshipped the one and only true God, the King of Kings. Furthermore, I find it very interesting how evangelicals use Gen uh, Genesis uh, chapter, chapter 12, verse 3, because I think this is a certain strain of the evangelical movement that talks in holy war terms, which actually reminds us of the Crusaders' chants. This is really a very fascinating thing, and it doesn't only apply to Christian Zionists. And I'll give you an example of that. I recently um, had a discussion with a pastor, a well-known uh, church pastor, and I asked him to pray for the children of Gaza in Palestine. He said to me, I'm sorry, I can't do that. He said, I don't want to create trouble in my church because, you see, I believe in the prophecy. He said, all these Jews are going to gather in Israel. And then with a big smirk on his face, he said, uh, all these Jews are going to die because of Armageddon. I was thinking to myself, so this pastor guy who really doesn't like the Jews, who thinks they're all going to be destroyed, yet he still politically supports Zionism in the uh, state of Israel. Not because he really loves them or cares about them, but because it fits in his twisted theology. Interestingly enough, this is a shared hate feeling. There is a shared hate by both the evangelicals and the Jewish Zionists, who, by the way, can't even stand any other race especially American evangelicals, but they love their money. The bottom line is, America has remained firmly behind Israel as its greatest supporter. In fact, Israel receives more U.S. money and weapons than any other country in the world. This support, as I said earlier, is attributed to a very strong, wealthy, and very pro-Israeli lobby in America which is true, but you would think that the majority of the strength behind this lobby would be the Jewish community in the US, which is only partially correct. Because as it turns out, in terms of sheer numbers, the evangelical Christians from America's Bible Belt actually make up the majority of this lobby power base. Most Americans probably think that the pro-Israeli lobby is largely a Jewish thing. Actually, the most of its support comes from the Bible Belt, where evangelical Christians um, believe that Israel has a right to exist because God said so. Now, if they are the people of the Bible, who are you? What people are you? If they are the people of the Bible, why are you committing live genocide if they are people of the bible why do they hate christians so much why do they kill christians in palestine we're talking about american christians and american activists doctors and nurses would you go back to gaza in a heartbeat in an absolute heartbeat uh, my heart is in gaza it will stay in gaza the Palestinian people that I worked with, both our national staff in the office, as well as my staff at Indonesia Hospital, were some of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. Um, when everything went off um, and we got the notice to move south of Wadi Gaza, I was texting my, my nurses at Indonesia Hospital and I said, 
we, we lost a nurse weekend one. Um, he was killed when the ambulance outside the hospital was blown up. And I was texting them when we got the evacuation orders and I said, did any of you move south? Did any of you get out? Like, are any of you coming down this way? And the only answer I got was, this is our community. This is our family. These are our friends. If they're gonna kill us, we're gonna die saving as many people as we can. And I said, if I can ever have an ounce of the heart that you have, I will, I will die a happy person. They were incredible. I would like to send out a reminder that there are civilians seeking shelter there and that my doctors and nurses didn't leave out of loyalty to their community. And I know that there is an idea being pushed right now that anyone that stayed behind is going to be considered some kind of a threat. And I want to remind people that the people that stayed behind are heroes. The people that stayed behind are, are they know they're gonna die and they're choosing to stay behind anyway. You're talking about doctors, nurses in the hospital. I wake up every morning and I send out a text message and I ask, are you alive? And every night before I go to sleep, I send another message and says, are you alive? Well, Kelly, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Wake up all Christians. You are being fooled. They're using the Bible to emotionally control you and manipulate you because they are in desperate need of your financial support. Most of Israel, most of Israel's financial support does come from Jewish wallets that are close to 70 million evangelicals in America versus less than 14 million Jews worldwide. And given that roughly 80% of these Christians support Israel, that makes American Christians the largest pro-Israeli voting bloc in the world, about four times the size of the Jewish community on earth. There is a lot of money behind the Christian Zionist movement. Most of the money, SUFI, Christian United for Israel, sends to Israel is spent on buildings and organizations in Israeli settlement, stolen from Palestinian lands. These are massive Jewish communities built well within Palestinian territory in violation of international law. The settlements, the settlements are run by some of the most fanatical Zionists who believe the Bible entitles them to this land. And that's um, any of it back to the Palestinians would be a violation of God's will. The evangelicals not only lobby Washington and send money to Israel, but also make up over 40% of American tourists in Israel every year with popular popular holy land program tours and many of these tours actually have stops in the israeli settlements which are used by the settlers to solicit donations by their for their uh, cause the focus of their tours is actually the real reason evangelicals uh, overwhelmingly want the jews to control of all of israel which is the actual end times as an Armageddon, because according to their interpretation of the Bible, Jewish controlled Holy Land will actually lead directly to the second coming of Christ. The Palestinian people are suffering uh, injustices that have yet to be rectified, um, and the Christian community contributes to that. The Christian Zionist movement is super powerful, even more powerful than the Jewish Zionist movement. Ten to one, some might say. Many, many Christians will send money to Israel and they'll think you know, um, they'll send money to build playgrounds in Israel. But actually, they're building playgrounds in settlements that are built on land that's been confiscated from Palestinians. They don't know most of the time. I, when I went to the Holy Land for the first time, I was going on a spiritual pilgrimage to Israel, and I saw signs on that trip that said, Free Palestine. And I had three master's degrees and was getting my PhD, and I thought Palestine was a map in the back of my Bible. I had no idea. There was so much that I didn't know. Went to the Bethlehem Bible College. The founder of it, Bashar Awad, told his family's story and how his father 
was killed in 1948, and I learned the word Nakba, which means catastrophe. And I had never heard this story before, and I literally was overcome. Like, you can see the tears in my eyes. I think it's devastating that literally millions and millions of Christians every year go to Israel and they never meet a Christian. Did you meet a Palestinian Christian? I think if Christian Zionists have the opportunity to be exposed to the reality of the Palestinian people, that they might have different thoughts and understandings about what's really happening in the Holy Land. According to the Jewish Zionists, even Palestinian Christian families have to give up their lands. It doesn't matter Palestinian Jews or Palestinian Christians. Anything that is Palestinian must be eradicated because the Bible says so. The evangelicals also believe that once the Jews take over all of Israel, then they get to hover on the garden. I've read the Bible and it doesn't say God is a real estate agent, but that's exactly what this evangelicals um, and Jewish Zionists are, real estate blood agents. The Christian Zionist uh, organizations are giving money to the most ideological settlers. And of course, that's not a very Christian-like. This is the truth. And there is always going to be a religious component to people's views on politics and everything else. The question is, what kind of religion is it? A moderate or is it an intolerant, fanatical religion? We see it through the way the Christian Zionist movement deal with the Palestinians, whether Muslim Palestinians, Christian Palestinians, or even Jewish Palestinians. For them, Palestinians either non-existent or they're the enemies of God because they're the enemies of the state of Israel. Its appeal for Christian Zionism is very broad, but it's very thin. It's not very deep. It's not as fundamental to their identity as issues like abortion or, uh, for example, or homosexuality. So for them, support for Israel is like a default position that they have not thought much about because they were never really asked or questioned or challenged on it. My interactions with Christian Zionists have been that they are very shallow. They don't really know the facts. They are manipulated by the lies of the Israeli Zionists because they read about Israel in the Bible and they equate the Israel of the Bible with the modern day Israel state of Israel. They sort of jump over thousands of years of history and they jump over most of the Old and the New Testament. Any book that instructs you to commit genocide so that somehow a Messiah comes down and sits on the temple as a political king, any book that gives you the impression that you are better than the rest of humanity, any book that is forged and interpolated to give you yourself authority to occupy the lands of other, bomb civilians, burn the children and women alive, rape the prisoners, displace and ethnically cleanse the original inhabitants, and above all, turn around and try to convince the whole world that the live genocide we just watch did not actually happen, and you are the victim in this case. This book cannot and is not from God Almighty that I know, the most compassionate, the most merciful. This is what they believe. They believe this is what the Bible teaches. God says it, I believe it. What's interesting is that you find more Christian Zionists among white evangelicals who tend to be more Republicans than Democrats. But why is that? Because Democrats are mostly Catholics and their support for Zionism is purely political, but not necessarily religious. So now you get an idea of what goes behind the scenes between Republicans and Democrats on so many issues. Christian Zionism is a phenomenon more closely allied with the Republican right-wing politicians. However, there are people who are manipulative. These are the politicians who could really care less about the third temple or the second coming of Jesus. 
that's not what motivates them. Rather, it's their own desires and interests. Regardless, this evangelical Christians, including the dirty American politicians, remain a major force in societies around the world. And the truth is, they have helped supplant functioning multi-ethnic, multi-faith communities around the world with sectarian divisions and religion-infused intolerance. They have used religion as a driver on all political issues, replacing the aspects of tolerance and empathy by sectarianism and hate. Their belief of supremacy, which they claim stems from their religion, their book, is very dangerous and honestly makes it much harder and even impossible to have any sort of discussions about justice because they could care less about justice. They want to control and there is nothing that scares them the most than losing control. Now let's examine the Christian belief about Jesus that is actually very similar to the Islamic belief. Jesus in Christianity is the Messiah and he shall come back towards the end of times. Jews and Zionists do not believe in this. They are waiting for a Mashiach or Mashiach that is not the Christians and the Muslims Jesus. Antichrist or the false Messiah shall be killed by Jesus Christ in the great Armageddon. Uh, most Christians and Muslims, we all believe the same thing. And of course, with some differences. We as Muslims don't have the idea that Armageddon will only happen when Bani Israel or the children of Israel are gathered in the Holy Land. The state of Israel we know of today will be perished out of the face of the earth way, way before the second coming of Jesus. And the Jews who live in Iran or Persia would make up the majority of the followers of the false Messiah. These are there are a lot of Jews in Iran right now. And all of this talks about the U.S. and Israel going to war against, uh, you know, each other is just a mental game. I want you to, uh, to understand that. And I want you to remember that. The evangelicals, however, believe that Jesus will only come back when all of the Jews are gathered in the Holy Land. And therefore, because they are eager to see their Lord and their Savior, they are willing to do everything they can, including supporting Israel with money and weapons to kill civilians in Palestine. By now, you realize that some of the most hardcore Zionists are not Jews. They are Christian evangelicals. What's even bizarre, these evangelicals believe when their Savior Jesus comes back, one of the first things he's going to do is destroy those who did not believe in him, who are the very same Jews they are supporting in genocide. Because according to their belief, they tried to kill him or succeeded in killing him. I want you to think about this absurdity. I need you to understand this point here. The Christian evangelicals are doing everything in their power to support an apartheid state of Israel in killing civilians, children, and women with the belief that the evangelicals believe that this Jewish people, these settlers, these Europeans, whoever they are and wh whoever they're from, will all be destroyed in the same land they stole from the Palestinians. Like whoever instilled these satanic ideas into people's minds knew they are dumb and stupid enough not only to believe it, but also to die for it. Not only that, the other group, the Jewish Zionists, accepts and takes the evangelicals' aids, knowing that this group, the evangelicals, want them dead. This is how both sides think. And therefore, they are friends with benefits. But the hate, the hate they have for each other is invisible. Trump, for example, who, by the way, Trump will win the election. He knows what he's doing. He is not an idiot. He is feeding his base. He's given them the, um, the scraps from the table. 
You know why? Remember when I said that most Republicans are evangelicals and Democrats are Catholics? Trump knows his base is evangelical. He knows these people and they want him in office, even though he hates the Jews. And because they want this land of Palestine to be the promised land for the promised people so that the Messiah comes back and gets rid of this very people to establish heaven on earth. Now, how about the Jews? What do they believe? Most Christians who support Israel have no clue what the Jews believe about the end of time. There is a reason why the majority of Antichrist's followers will be from the Jews. In Jewish, Jewish eschatology, the term Messiah, it refers specifically to a future king from the line of Davidic line. And he is not the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the Christians and the Muslims believe in. The Jewish Messiah is called the Mashiach or the Mashiach, the king who will rule the Jewish people during the Messianic age. To the Jews, the Mashiach is a political figure, not a religious reformer. To the Jews, the Mashiach is the one who will bring power and politics. So the Mashiach in Jewish folklore is a king who will bring about the restoration of the status of the Israelites and reconstructs the Temple of Israel. This has been a mainstream of ancient medieval and even some modern Jewish movements. When Jewish, uh, when when the uh, Jesus came and began preaching to the Jews, he claimed he was the Messiah to them. And like when we talked about John Hagee earlier, who claims that Jesus did not tell the Jews he was the Messiah, which is laughable for someone who teaches the Christian scripture. The Jews did not believe in Jesus and did not care about a spiritual Messiah, a spiritual reformer. They wanted a Messiah who is a king. And so when they found out that this person, Jesus, is not a king, they went and complained to the king, the Roman emperor. And they said, we have a man who is claiming to be the king of the Israelites. Now, did Jesus claim to be a king? Why did the Jews accuse Jesus that he's claiming to be king? Pay attention, because he claimed to be the Messiah. And in their eyes, in the Jewish eyes, the Messiah is who the king is. So Pontius Pilate said this Messiah is a political agitator. And this Messiah made the Jews angry. Pontius said that the Jews would not care if Jesus Son of Mary said he is a religious reformer. But Pontius did worry that this Messiah, since he's claiming to be a king in the eyes of the Jews, the Romans did not want any political trouble. And that's why what happened happened. And I'm not going into uh, what happened after they went to arrest Jesus Christ. What I want you to understand is that the belief in the advent of the Messiah for the Jews was a mainstream of Jewish theology. And for them, the Messiah, the Mashiach, will bring back the power and the kingdom of David that used to be, and therefore all of their um, uh, history. Uh, the greatest Maimonides, the greatest Jewish mind, the Jewish theologian, the most famous uh, in the history of Judaism, Maimonides, the single greatest intellectual of Jewish history completely. He is called the chief Rabbi Rambam, and he is the first and the most important Jewish figure to write a book of creed. He summarized it in 13 points, and he called it the 13 principles of faith, which summarized it, uh, what he viewed as the required beliefs of Judaism. Maimonides was the first person to write a systematic code of all Jewish law, the Mishnah Torah, and most of his writings actually were in Arabic. If you did not know he was Jewish, you might easily make the mistake of saying 
that a Muslim was writing. That is, if you didn't read any of his Jewish writings. Maimonides presents these articles of faith as usul, roots, and qawaid, fundamentals, and Jewish beliefs, etiqadat. Uh, and of all the law of the Sharia, because the Jewish people have also a Sharia law as well. So in the 12th principle of this 13 articles of faith is the coming of the Messiah. The cradle form starts with, I quote, I believe with perfect faith or full faith in the coming of the Messiah, end of quote. This is in the faith of Maimonides, which is the standard of the Jewish people up until our time. He is the only one who has codified to that level with full faith, certainty in the coming of the Messiah, saying and even uh, and even though he delays or with all that delays, I eagerly await the arrival every day and anticipating his arrival. This is the creed of Maimonides um, and that the Jews would memorize that they still believe to this day. And as I have mentioned to you earlier with an Orthodox, there are many, many uh, strands. And of course, you have the Hasidic Orthodox. Uh, you are all familiar with the Hasidic Jews, for example, have a very strong and passionate belief about the coming of the Messiah. And this is very important. They believe the more pious they are, the quickly the Mashiach will come back, and that explains their uh, fervorness. Some of them believe in the Mashiach, some others don't. Amongst the Orthodox, they all believe in the Messiah, is that clear belief in Messiah is common amongst the, uh, the Jews. So it's not surprising that towards the end of time, when the Antichrist comes with power, wealth, influence, and claims to be the Mashiach, it's not surprising that lots of people will accept him because these people are dying to see the Mashiach and they're doing everything in their power to expedite the coming of the Messiah, including committing genocide and building the third temple. They won't, they won't hesitate to accept the Antichrist when he claims to be the Mashiach. That's why our Prophet Muhammad Ali Salat was salam, uh, said that many of Antichrist followers will be of the Jews. Many are from those who choose to follow the Dajjal or the false Messiah, many will be from the Jewish background. The evangelicals, the Christian Zionists in America, are working full tilt to make the end of time a reality and using the voting strengths of their followers to get Washington on their side in a political uh, conflict that's already been hijacked by religious zealots, adding millions of doomsday ready American evangelicals to the table is like pouring gas on the fire in the most flammable region in the world. Till next time, inshallah. Greetings of peace and mercy. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.